sneezes in the air. Yellow dust blowing past my window, sticking to it. Cat sits there, staring outside. Episode 22. Greetings, and welcome in to the Patuxet General. I am your host, Jess. This week's recipe is not for the faint of heart. This episode is filled with alcohol. Of course, this is only meant for adults over 21 who drink responsibly. A recipe that started as a mistake and ended up a dream. Drunken pirate ham. The drink today is a daiquiri. Not to mention, we're really getting to the good part in the case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft. But first, I would like to thank our Patreon subscribers, without whom we would surely be lost. If you like what you hear, please feel free to join these folk. There is a link in the show notes. Are you ready for a doozy of a recipe? Let's talk about drunken pirate ham. About ten years ago, when my grill was new and I had twenty-somethings around the house, my dad and I decided to have a massive cookout. Local folk stopped by and a good time was had by all. I stood by the grill, cooking and drinking all day. The grill was red hot, and I had grilled everything in the house, all of the vegetables, all of the meats, even a few pineapples. So I sat down a bit sad because the grill was still red hot, and I didn't want to waste such an opportunity. I had a bit more rum. Then remembered that I had a frozen ham upstairs in the chest freezer. So I brought it down and gathered cabbage leaves and corn husks. I had a little more rum. The still plastic-wrapped rock-hard frozen ham may have taken a tumble around the backyard, much to the amusement of those in attendance. After I caught the runaway ham, I was thirsty, so I had a bit more rum. Then I unwrapped the ham, oh so delicately threw it into the hot smoker grill on top of cabbage leaves and corn husks on the cool side of the grill. Then I shut it down, closed all the vents, and threatened the onlookers not to touch. We finished the rest of the food and the booze and forgot all about the ham and went to bed. So, as you can imagine, both residents and guests awoke the next morning with large heads. Much coffee was consumed when we realized we had eaten all of the food cooked the night before. Daunted by the idea of breakfast shopping for eight folks with a head as big as Alaska, I looked for a solution. Searching the chest freezer, I noticed the ham was gone and had a vague memory of chasing it around outside. Cheese snacks! What did I do? So, after casually fleeing to the backyard, inside my cool, sealed smoker grill was the most beautiful ham I ever saw. It sliced like prosciutto. It smelled like a dream. I sliced this bad boy, scrambled eight eggs, and fed the blurry-eyed team, who, when finished, drifted away into the world with words of thanks and, why is the rum always gone? For this recipe, you will need one very hot grill smoker, one side hot, one side cold. I smoked with local applewood, one ham, frozen solid, corn husks and or cabbage leaves, and one large bottle of rum. Now, first, in preparation, drink rum. Gather your ingredients, drink rum, combine the grill corn husks, and ham in a way that doesn't burn you or the ham. Uh, Drink rum. Close down the grill tight. No air in or out. Then drink until you pass out, forget the ham, or run out of rum. Remember ham in the morning. Enjoy! This week you have a choice between two famous versions of this lovely rum drink. The first is the generally accepted origin and the most celebrated recipe. It starts in Cuba, possibly 1896, when a man named Jennings Stanton Cox wrote out this recipe on a card and signed it. However, it's more likely that he appropriated a local drink and named it after the local port, Daiquiri. During the U.S. fascination with Cuba, Ernest Hemingway tried the Floridita Daiquiri on one of his stays there. His reply was, that's good, but I prefer it without sugar and double the rum. This is the original Hemingway daiquiri and our second pick for the day. It would go well with ham. For both these drinks, you will need a shaker with a top and a strainer. 
two ounces white rum, three quarters of an ounce lime, three quarters of an ounce simple syrup, one quarter ounce Luxardo maraschino liqueur, one quarter ounce grapefruit juice, and crushed ice. The classic version first. This is the simplest of drinks. Just watch your measure and you'll amaze every time. As usual, chill your martini glass, fill your shaker three quarters of the way with crushed ice. Then add two ounces of white rum, your choice, then three quarters of an ounce lime juice and three quarters of an ounce simple syrup as well. Shake furiously for about 30 seconds. Then strain into your chilled glass. Perfect and simple. Now, if we take that idea and make it sour, we'll try the Hemingway daiquiri. In our shaker, three quarters of the way filled with crushed ice. Pour two and one half ounces of white rum of your choice, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, one quarter ounce of Luxardo maraschino liqueur, and one quarter ounce grapefruit juice. Once again, shake furiously, strain, and serve in a chilled glass. Very refreshing on a hot day. Dare I say, even a cookout? Enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft Chapter 3, Section 5 a school of alienists, slightly less academic than Dr. Lyman's, assigned to Ward's European trip the beginning of his true madness. Admitting that he was sane when he started, they believe that his conduct upon returning implies a disastrous change. But even to this claim, Dr. Willette refuses to accede. There was, he insists, something latter. And the queernesses of the youth at this stage he attributes to the practice of rituals being learned abroad. Odd enough things to be sure, but by no means implying mental aberration on the part of their celebrant. Ward himself, though visibly aged and hardened, was still normal in his general reactions, and in several talks with Willette displayed a balance which no madman, even an incipient one, could feign continuously for long. What elicited the notion of insanity at this period were the sounds heard at all hours from Ward's attic laboratory, in which he kept himself most of the time. There were chantings and repetitions and thunderous declamations in uncanny rhythms. And although these sounds were always in Ward's own voice, there was something in the quality of that voice and in the accents of the formulae it pronounced, which could not but chill the blood of every hearer. It was noticed that the venerable and beloved black cat of the household bristled and arched his back when certain of the tones were heard. The odors occasionally wafting from the laboratory were likewise exceedingly strange. Sometimes they were very noxious, but more often they were aromatic with a haunting, elusive quality, which seemed to have the power of inducing fantastic images. People who smelled them had a tendency to glimpse momentary mirages of enormous vistas, with strange hills or endless avenues of sphinxes and hippogriffs stretching off into infinite distance. Ward did not resume his old-time rambles, but applied himself diligently to the strange books he had brought home, and to equally strange delvings within his quarters, explaining that European sources had greatly enlarged the possibilities of his work, and promising great revelations in the years to come. His older aspect increased to a startling degree his resemblance to the Kerwin portrait in his library. And Dr. Willette would often pause by the latter after a call, marveling at the virtual identity, and reflecting that only the small pit above the picture's right eye now remained to differentiate the long-dead wizard with a living youth. These calls of Willette's, undertaken at the request of the senior wards, were curious affairs, 
Ward at no time repulsed the doctor, but the latter saw that he could not reach the young man's inner psychology. Frequently, he noted peculiar things about little wax images of grotesque design on the shelves or tables, and the half-erased remnants of circles, triangles, and pentagrams in chalk or charcoal on the cleared central space of the large room. And always in the night, those rhythms and incantations thundered till it became very difficult to keep servants or suppress furtive talk in the Charles Madness. In January 1927, a peculiar incident occurred. One night about midnight, as Charles was chanting a ritual whose weird cadence echoed unpleasantly through the house below, there came a sudden gust of chill wind from the bay and a faint, obscure trembling of the earth which everyone in the neighborhood noted. At the same time, the cat exhibited phenomenal traces of fright, and the dogs bayed for as much as a mile around. This was a prelude to a sharp thunderstorm, anomalous for the season, which brought with it such a crash that Mr. and Mrs. Ward believed the house had been struck. They rushed upstairs to see what damage had been done, but Charles met them at the door to the attic, pale, resolute, and portentous, with the most fearsome combination of triumph and seriousness on his face. He assured them that the house had not really been struck, and that the storm would soon be over. They paused, and looking through a window, they saw he was indeed right, for the lightning flashed further and further away, while the trees ceased to bend in the strange, frigid gust of from the water. The thunder sank to a sort of dull, mumbling chuckle, and finally died away. Stars came out, and the stamp of triumph on Charles Ward's face crystallized into a very singular expression. For two months or more after this incident, Ward was less confined than usual to his laboratory. He exhibited a curious interest in the weather and made odd inquiries about the date of the spring thawing of the ground. One night, late in March, he left the house after midnight and did not return till almost morning, when his mother, being wakeful, heard a rumbling motor draw up the carriage entrance. Muffled oaths could be distinguished, and Mrs. Ward, rising and going to the window, saw four dark figures removing a long, heavy box from a truck in Charles' direction and carrying it within by the side door. She heard labored breathing and ponderous footfalls on the stairs, and finally a dull thumping in the attic, after which the footfalls descended again and the four men reappeared outside and drove off in their truck. The next day, Charles resumed his attic seclusion, drawing down the dark shades of his laboratory windows and appearing to be working on some metal substance. He would open the door to no one and steadfastly refused all offered food. About noon, a wrenching sound followed by a terrible cry and a fall were heard. But when Mrs. Ward rapped at the door, her son at length answered faintly and told her that nothing had gone amiss. The hideous and indescribable stench now welling out was absolutely harmless and unfortunately necessary. Solitude was one prime essential, and he would appear later for dinner. That afternoon, after the conclusion of some odd hissing sounds which came from behind the locked portal, he did finally appear. Wearing an extremely haggard aspect and forbidding anyone to enter the laboratory upon any pretext. This, indeed, proved the beginning of a new policy of secrecy, for never afterward was any other person permitted to visit either the mysterious garret workroom or the adjacent storeroom which he cleaned out, furnished roughly, and added to his private domain as a sleeping apartment. Here he lived with books brought up from his library beneath, till the time he purchased the Patuxet bungalow and moved to it all of his scientific effects. In the evening, Charles secured the paper before the rest of the family and damaged part of it through an apparent accident. Later on, Dr. Willett, having fixed the date from statements by various members of the household, looked up an intact copy at the journal office and found that in the destroyed section the following small item had occurred. 
Nocturnal Diggers Surprised in North Burial Ground. Robert Hart, night watchman of the North Burial Ground, this morning discovered a party of several men with a motor truck in the oldest part of the cemetery, but apparently frightened them off before they could accomplish whatever their object had been. The discovery took place at four o'clock, when Hart's attention was attracted by the sound of a motor outside his shelter. Investigating, he saw a large truck on the main drive several rods away, but could not reach it before the sound of his feet on the gravel had revealed his approach. The men hastily placed a large box in the truck and drove away down the street before they could be overtaken. And since no grave was disturbed, Hart believes that this box was an object which they had wished to bury. The diggers must have been at work for a long while before detention, for Hart found an enormous hole dug at a considerable distance back from the roadway in the lot of Amasa Field, where most of the old stones have long ago disappeared. This hole, a place as large and deep as a grave, was empty and did not coincide with any intermittent mention in the cemetery records. Sergeant Riley of the second station viewed the spot and gave the opinion that the hole was dug by bootleggers rather gruesomely and ingeniously seeking a safe cache for liquor in a place not likely to be disturbed. In reply to questions, Hart said he thought the escaping truck had headed up Rochambeau Avenue, though he could not be sure. During the next few days, Charles Ward was seldom seen by his family. Having added sleeping quarters to his attic realm, he kept closely to himself up there, ordering food brought to the door and not taking it in until after the servant had gone away. The droning of monotonous formulae and the chanting of bizarre rhythms reoccurred at intervals, while at other times occasional listeners could detect the sound of tinkling glass, hissing chemicals, running water, or roaring gas flames odors of the most unplaceable quality, wholly unlike any before noted, hung at times around the door, and the air of tension observable in the young recluse whenever he did venture forth was such as to excite the keenest speculation. Once he made a hasty trip to the Athenaeum for a book he required, and again he hired a messenger to fetch him a highly obscure volume from Boston. Suspense was written portentously over the whole situation, and both the family and Dr. Willette confessed themselves wholly at a loss of what to do or think about it. That concludes this episode of the PG. We would like to thank you for joining us. And if you would like to reach us with a question, comment, booking, advertising, or ghost story, our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. Thank you again, and please meet us back here next time at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production. Pre-recorded in Patuxet.